You are in the UC conference room B in a track called In the Thick of It, if this is not where you're supposed to be. Get out of here. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this event today. St. Mary's University, USAA, Trend Micro, Digital Defense, SAMS, Texas Cyber Summit. And the speaker you're about to hear today, Megan Roddy, she's going to talk to you about how neurodiversity can be leveraged for an excellent ROI. Take away, Thank you. <clears throat> okay. uh, so to begin, just a quick introduction of myself. Um, I'm a, currently a cyber threat researcher at IBM. Um, I'm also the CFO of Mental Health Hackers, who are looking for sponsors. So if your company is interested, <laughs> come talk to me. And running the Mental Health Village uh, across the way here, so come check that out too. Um, the reason I speak on this topic um, is actually from personal experience. I have Asperger's syndrome, and so I talk from the experience of being an autistic employee in the security industry. To start off, a couple disclaimers. Um, first, I don't have a degree in psychology. I'm not a therapist. I, I'm not an expert by any means. Uh, I read some blogs. I read some books. I read some research papers. But at no point will I claim that I'm an expert uh, or formally trained in this topic. <laughs> Again, not a psychiatrist. Um, but I will say that because of my public-facing advocacy and my work in the area of mental health awareness in the industry, I have met a lot of people who have shared their stories. And that's why, since I've given my talk um, in past years on autism specifically, I've expanded this talk to reach a more diverse crowd of bipolar disorder and ADHD also because of the people I've met along the way. And lastly, uh, the a lot of the what I talk about is based on the fact that uh, I have autism and I seem to be doing okay, so I'm doing something right, and I want to share my experiences. So first, uh, overview of neurodiversity. Um, as IBM says, we treasure the wild ducks. Another disclaimer, neurodiversity, part of the word is diversity, and uh, even within the classification of neurodiverse disorders, there is much diversity. An example of this I found really apt was uh, a famous autism advocate on Twitter asked what uh, stereotypes people feel they defy. Well, one of the stereotypes is autistic people are good at math, and so many people called out that. They said, I'm terrible at math. I hate it. Um, so I, I defy that stereotype. Also, a lot of people said they can make eye contact, which is also a common thing that a stereotype of people with autism can't make contact. At the same time, she asked the exact opposite question but got the same answers. People can make eye contact and people are really good at math. Um, so even when I talk about generalizations in this talk, it's still worth noting that there's a lot of diversity and not everything I apply applies to every person, but it will apply to a good chunk of people. Um, so why should you support neurodiversity as a manager or an employee at an organization? First, you get a wider spectrum of capabilities. When somebody is building a sports team, a football team, basketball, soccer, they're not just hiring the strongest player, uh, bringing on the strongest players or recruiting the fastest players. Um, a team comprised of just the best quarterbacks in the world is not going to be the best football team uh, because you need more to your team. So in the same way of thinking, your security team is only going to be uh, – the strongest team it can be if you have the different versions of speaking. Uh, another analogy that has been used by Steve Silverman, another autism advocate, is that um, the human brain uh, and diversity, it can be thought of as an operating system. Some people run Linux, some people run Windows, some people run Mac, and no matter what you're running, uh, it, there's benefits and there's challenges that are faced. <coughs> So sometimes things, there's going to be C-suite people who don't care about, uh, sorry, I guess I missed a point. The second point of happier and passionate employees, people who enjoy where they work and feel like they're treated with respect and are accepted despite potential disorders, disabilities, um, they're going to be happier employees. But 
<clears throat> for the C-suite people who may not think happy employees and lots of different brains is good enough reason to start a neurodiversity initiative, um, some of the swaying points, they like numbers and they like knowing how to save money. So first, um, direct replacement costs, it's been found that they can reach as high as 50 to 60 percent of an employee's annual salary when an employee leaves. And the total cost associated with a turnover, whether it be um, the training cost to hire someone, bring them in and get them up to speed, um, any accommodations, changing insurance, etc., all those can eventually range to 90, between 90 and 200 percent of an employee's annual salary, which is a huge cost. Cost. But employers have found that uh, employees with disabilities are less likely to leave a company without dis um, than employees without disabilities because often if they find an environment that they're comfortable and work well in, uh, they're going to want to stay with that environment because it's so much harder to find a place where uh, they, they get that sort of treatment. So treat them well, they'll stick around, you're going to save money. Second point, consumer appeal. Um, there, if you take, uh, every auto, the one in 49 or 45, whatever the statistic is for a number of people diagnosed with autism in the U.S., and you tack on, um, their direct relatives, their parents, grandparents, cousins, siblings, you get 17% of the U.S. population. Match this with the statistic that 93% of consumers have a more positive images of companies that support a cause they care about, and that 89% of consumers would be willing to switch brands given matching price and quality uh, to one associated with a cause. The consumer appeal brought on by outwardly supporting neurodiversity is going to bring great return for your company. And lastly, I debated a long time adding this one um, because there's a lot of controversy around quotas and stuff. But the truth is, currently, especially in the U.S., where a lot of cybersecurity companies are contracting with the government, um, many companies have requirements about the percentage of employees with disabilities that they have to have as part of their organization. So you are meeting a quota also by hiring these employees. And another reason to um, make employees with invisible disabilities more comfortable is they're more likely to disclose their disability um, when being polled about quotas like that. So, uh, quota meeting, no matter how controversial, it's, it's a thing. So, so in terms of um, being a successful individual um, in the industry uh, while living with a neurodiverse disorder, um, The Power of Neurodiversity, a book by Thomas Armstrong, it talks about uh, I think seven principles um, associated with how a neurodiverse individual succeeds in life. Uh, number five, principle number five, is that success in life is based on um, adapting one's brain to the needs of the surrounding environment, adjusting to living in a neurotypical world. However, at the same time, principle six, while may, it may sound kind of opposite of this uh, statement, it also depends on modifying your surrounding um, environment to fit the needs of your unique brain. This is called niche construction, and I'll talk about that. Uh, I'll bring up that term multiple times. So basically, it just means um, that along with me having to learn how to live in a neurotypical world, there's some things I have to do that allow me to live um, it, with my brain. <laughs> So um, the first section that I focus on, the one that I'm kind of most familiar with, obviously, and most comfortable with is autism spectrum disorders. So some of the challenges that maybe have faced um, in terms of employment with neurodiverse individuals, autistic individuals specifically, is communication deficits. Um, how employee, how neurodiverse employees communicate with their coworkers, management, um, clients is going to be different than a neurotypical person. Um, and typically, a lot of those times, they, their communication methods are kind of more negative, uh, a, a bit weaker. Um, different, I'd just say it's different way of communicating, but because of how neurotypicals would then interpret that communication, it ends up being more, more of a, a bad thing. 
The second is being obsessive. Um, I put this as a challenge because it can be distracting for the brain. Um, it can also be in a social manner, uh, kind of seen as a disability to those around the individual, being obsessed with a topic, um, especially combined with the social skills of not learning, being able to take social cues. A lot of times an individual, you've probably either experienced yourself or seen in TV shows or know about it is uh, you have an autistic person who's obsessed with trains and will stand there and talk to you about trains and no matter how hard you try to change the topic, it just keeps coming back to that. So socially, that can be a challenge. Um, I've, but I also actually consider it a strength in the sense that um, I can become obsessive about a topic related to my job, and that just pushes me to become an expert in that area, um, and and I can learn really quick. So it, if if shaped in the right way, it can be a strength. <laughs> But specific strengths to talk about are attention to detail, being able to see things that may be missed right by a, a neurotypical employee. You'll find a lot of autistic employees in quality assurance roles and a lot of hiring programs to get them into quality assurance roles because they can spot little bugs and little things that a neurotypical person may not see. Uh, Israel, their army actually has a dedicated unit of only autistic individuals who uh, sit in a sock essentially uh, for 24-7 looking at satellite images and looking for changes that could indicate enemy movement or um, explosive being planted because they are able to focus in on those things and enjoy finding those little changes. Sorry. Uh, and lastly, high productivity. Um, I haven't really been able to explain how it happens, but I myself, and as has been found with many other autistic individuals, I can do two to four times the amount of work a, per a neurotypical coworker could do on the same task. Um, I don't know what it is that causes that, but it is something I've found, so that definitely works. Yeah. Um. So this is, I'm, I'm autistic. Um, yeah. There's, I've, I've also wondered about the high productivity thing. Yeah. There's something, about my personal obsession is that this is a dragon. Yeah. And I can build, mm. they're kind of like characters, world, yeah. and 20 times the speed anybody else I know. Yeah, yeah. And I've, when I looked into it, I found that a lot of it has to do with skipping a large portion of the work that's, that a normal person would have to do, or that a neurotypical person yeah. would have to do. By making mental connections that don't make sense unless you understand. Yeah, understanding. for sure. Yeah, and I think I used to be faster at math probably because of the same reason. I could skip steps and do more within one step. Um, and then also, I think it's a lot about, I think we're able to find efficient methods of doing things and kind of streamlining things. So it's probably a combination of those different things. <laughs> um, and then going back to the niche construction, creating an environment in which the individual is going to thrive better. Um, so for example, um, modulation of sensory input. There's a lot of sensory processing issues associated with autism. Um, for me, one of the things when I was looking for jobs, I was specifically like one of my criteria that, that seems dumb to sway my choice with working with a job was I wanted a job where I could wear whatever I want because I have so much trouble um, being comfortable in clothing, and when I have to wear clothing that I'm not comfortable in, my productivity level drops. Um, I get distracted by what I'm wearing as opposed to what I'm doing. So it actually became a factor in my job hunting that I wanted a place, and I ended up in a remote job, um, but I was also looking at companies who had a casual dress policy. But this could also mean things such as um, allowing the individual to wear noise-canceling headphones in the office, um, ensuring the lights, any flickering lights are fixed that may be bothering them, such as that, things like that. Um, stimming, which you guys probably would recognize as the kind of the stereotypical hand flapping or rocking that an autistic individual can do. A lot of times um, there's a lot of controversy in the community about uh, therapies trying to stop that behavior. But in the end, the way I see it, it doesn't hurt anyone. If I want to sway side to side while I'm working, it's kind of just let the person do that. As long as it's not hurting you or your business, uh, 
if they're going to be more productive, if they're allowed to do that things, there's reasons, there's psychological reasons autistic individuals stem. Um, so letting them do that is only going to increase their comfort in your office and their productivity on the work. <laughs> So some negative job elements, again, when I'm saying these things, I'm not, it, there are people who are good at this list of things and are autistic, um, but some of the things that just in the general psychological point of view about how an autistic brain usually operates, here are some ne negative job elements. Um, multitasking, I know I and many other individuals like to get to focus on a task and get it done, and so being in an environment where you could be working on a task and then you're pulled to another way and another way, or you have to keep track of multiple projects, it's going to reduce the effectiveness of being able to complete a task. Um, high levels of socialization. Again, some people don't mind it. Um, depending on the day, I like socializing with people, um, but it, other times having client-facing roles or, or roles that are like entirely group work all the time may not be the best um, option. And lastly, again, sensory overload, um, being in an environment that's going to be loud and it's going to um, maybe the, the issue is lights or things like that, um, being in an environment that makes them uncomfortable from a sensory processing perspective. <clears throat> um, job elements that would be positive and are well suited for a large number of autistic individuals are jobs where you can be in a routine. Um, I very much like knowing what I'm going to be doing the next day um, and, and go into work knowing what I'm doing. Uh, repetitive tasks, uh, we're good at finding efficient ways to do that, producing a high quantity volume of work that is repetitive. Um, and often the, the benefit to a team as a whole is repetitive tasks are a lot of times it's menial work and it's stuff that a neurotypical employee will not enjoy and wants to hand off. So if there's somebody on that team who is happily and willing to take on that work, that's a benefit to the whole team. Um, even in my own job, I have a lot of data processing work and I kind of just do a lot of everyone else's for them because I really like doing it, but they don't like sitting and sifting through data and, you know, just entering data into a database uh, for, for hours in a day. So I, I enjoy doing it myself, so I take that over. Um, and then logic. Uh, a lot of autistic people are very logical, um, and so being able to make those connections, especially in the security industry and IT industry, uh, thinking at the level of a computer type thing is, is very beneficial. So what are some roles in our industry that might suit this? Um, what I personally do and I found is well suited for me, my background is actually in SOC work and DEFER and I love it, um, but I've just found the job elements and the kind of setting that I'm working in uh, for threat research is really well suited for me. Um, it's a lot of data processing, it's a lot of connecting the dots, like I do a lot of malware research type stuff where I have to connect the dots between um, different operations. Threat hunting due to kind of, like I said, like with the Israeli army looking at changes and different things, being able to spot those little things that are out of place and pull them out so that you can, you can uh, be able to find, find evil in a, in a large amount of data. Um, and vulnerability analysis. Um, I could never do it full time, but I, I have done a bit of it and kind of getting a report that means, uh, you know, it's, if you've ever seen a vulnerability report, they spit out everything, handing them and just trying to work off of a full report of 500 vulnerabilities is not working. So being able to take 500 vulnerabilities and process in a logical manner to produce meaningful data um, is something that I have at least experienced and based on the characteristics I've talked about are well suited. <laughs> So my next category is bipolar disorder. Uh, this section is largely based on interacting and talking and interviewing in some ways a group of um, bipolar security analysts. So some of the challenges um, that uh, so the security analysts I talked to face um, mood swings. Obviously, that's like the key uh, characteristic of bipolar individuals. Uh, they can go from being a state of euphoria, you know, that manic personality, to depressive states, um, to rage, and those kinds of things. Um, with schizoaffective uh, types of bipolar disorder, um, 
there's psychosis that can be involved, which of course, as you can imagine, would be a, a very big barrier um, to being able to operate uh, similar to a neurotypical. And lastly, distracted thoughts, um, kind of your brain going everywhere and thinking and moods, the distracted thoughts involved with mood swings. <laughs> so the strengths, however... Um, individuals with bipolar disorder typically are strong with, uh, have strong, like, em the, their empathy is strong, um, and so they're very empathetic individuals, uh, which can be a benefit in the industry for sure. Uh, they're also, during manic states at least, can have a high amount of energy. One of the guys I, I talked to said, like, yeah, during a depressive state or a rage state, he's like may not be doing his best, but as soon as he kicks into a manic state, he wants to work like 20 hours a day and like will keep going and doesn't even care. Um, and then lastly, creativity. Uh, bipolar and schizophrenic individuals tend to be very creative individuals, uh, which tends to be something not as commonly found in our industry. So it, it does, like I said, filling that gap, adding to your team's thinking styles. In terms of niche construction, bipolar individuals will do well in environments where they find meaning and purpose. They have something that can focus on and, and kind of think about as being their main <clears throat> main goal and may, having purpose there. Hands-on work is um, a characteristic that works well and being able to work for oneself, especially um, in when you're having different mood swings, being able to be in a place where they can work when they need to work and that type of stuff, work when they best work and not be on a schedule that could involve them being uh, in a negative, depressive, or rage state. So some job roles that based on the previous slides would be well fitting, um, again, provided to me by some bipolar individuals. Um, cybersecurity analysts, just because the, the work, there's that clear goal, meaning, purpose, and analyzing data, finding evil, that type of thing. Um, and then penetration testing and social engineering. Penetration testing is typically going to be an engagement-based thing, so it, it allows for that more flexible, like when I'm in a manic state, I can knock out an engagement, um, and there's kind of that room for movement. And then social engineering and penetration testing from the aspect of the empathy um, that those individuals typically have, being able to social engineer works well. Uh, lastly is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Again, a lot based on what I've read, a lot based on talking to individuals with ADHD, um, and especially through mental health hackers. A lot of the people we talk to are security analysts with ADHD, um, and so we've talked a lot to the wider community um, to get feedback that we can then provide to those individuals. Some challenges are weak executive functioning, um, which executive functioning is kind of like your ability um, to plan and schedule and um, a prioritize and those kinds of things, which uh, which are typically needed in a career. Um, they're, they're positive skills in a career, but weaker in a lot of individuals with ADHD. Also, hyperactivity. Um, obviously, it's in the name. Um, that that kind of mental state can often often cause challenges for the individual. Uh, strengths as hyper focus, um, be, they can get really focused on a task that they want. Um, they it's kind of. Uh, Contrary to what you might think based on stereotypes, because the whole distractibility thing in moving place to place, um, but typically it's more that the reason that's recognized is because it's more the uh, ADHD individual focusing on a specific thing that either interests them or um, that they've their brain for whatever reason has honed in on, and that is taking their distraction away from potentially other things that um, should be focused on. And then even though I listed it as a kind of a challenge, hyperactivity still becomes a, um, a, a benefit if channeled in the right way, being able to channel that energy um, into your work, um, especially if you're in a role where that, that hyperactivity and that energy and adrenaline is, is needed for the role. 
uh, niche construction a job with physical movement, um, uh, an environment where change is often occurring, there's high stimulation, um, and you're able to do a hands-on role. Those are the kind of niche construction, the, the areas that um, you're going to find ADHD individuals thrive in. So, so the job elements um, that you may see translating directly to job roles is jobs where you can travel or move around in locations frequently that change an environment. Um, being able to work with one's hands, uh, that's a typical trait that is found in ADHD. Um, being actively involved with new situations daily, almost opposite to autism where I want routine and pet repetitive work and know what's going on. A change in roles is actually um, better for ADHD individuals. Handling emergencies, um, there's research that shows a high concentration of ADHD individuals working um, as uh, firefighters and police officers because of that adrenaline rush. They thrive really well in those situations. And again, working for oneself, um, there's also a lot of research showing a high amount of high concentration of ADHD individuals who are CEOs and business owners because they also do well in those roles. So what are some job roles? Um, incident responder, that's kind of our industry's equivalent of a firefighter or a police officer. Uh, the situation where you get thrown in, time is of the essence, you don't exactly know what's going on and you got to figure it out, find solutions. Uh, that's probably one of the best roles. Um, threat hunting, again, the, the being able to, to channel that energy and that focus into finding something where you don't know where it is. Um, and then lastly, consulting. This isn't really a specific job, but kind of a consulting element to whatever role you choose. Um, do the, that often involves travel, um, even if it doesn't involve travel. Typically, con when you're doing consulting, you're changing environments a lot. You have engagements, so you may be somewhere for a month and then go do something else and keep going back and forth. <clears throat> so to summarize, I kind of, as a whole, look at what each individual can do. For the neurodiverse individual, it's important that the individual recognizes their strengths and weaknesses um, and learns uh, learn what works for them uh, because of that element of adapting to the environment around you. Uh, we do have a responsibility as neurodiverse individuals to do our best to meet um, our employers, our coworkers, our friends halfway. Um, if they do their best to understand us, we do our best to understand how to operate in their world. Um, so that's a really important thing. It takes time. <laughs> it's taken me a long time to kind of start recognizing things, and I kind of tackle different things at different times, um, one by one, to try and adapt as much as I can. And then self-improvement and self-care, in the end, these are mental disorders affecting the individual. Um, however you choose to do self-care, whether it's medication, therapy, exercise, whatever works for you, as long as you're focusing on that and recognizing that there there is things that can be done to help you and you should be focused on helping yourself um, and caring for yourself. <coughs> What can an organization do? They can promote neurodiversity and make sure their employees recognize that they support neurodiverse individuals because it's going to increase the likelihood those individuals come forward and speak about what they need, which in the end overall improves the environment. Um, look into neurodiverse hiring initiatives. There's a lot of recruitment firms that specifically work with neurodiverse individuals to get them into a position via a hiring process that works better than, for them than the traditional interview process. Um, so those kinds of initiatives are something to look into. Support your managers and employees. When your managers or employees come to you and say accommodations are needed or changes need to be made in how processes work, um, listen to them, work with them, make sure, again, kind of with that promoting neurodiversity, creating an environment where neurodiverse individuals feel comfortable um, and know that they can bring these challenges forward uh, without negative impact.
And then lastly, something that's very rare in companies, look into how your health insurance plans are, uh, are handling uh, mental health uh, situations. Can your employees go to therapy um, and get the help they need that they may not get through traditional uh, avenues that you would get with physical health issues? Um, so an employee being able to afford uh, therapy and stuff based on insurance is an important aspect. Going down a step, what can the manager do? The main thing is to accommodate and adjust. Learn that the way you uh, manage a neurodiverse employee is not going to be the same as you manage a neurotypical employee, um, but recognize that the, if you work with them to change that management style, you're going to end up having a more productive, a happier, a better employee. Advocate. Um, both upward, uh, both up and down. Make sure your organization understands that this is important, um, that you've learned it's important, and you want to work towards creating an organizational um, neurodiverse advocacy view. Um, and also advocate down. A lot of times there will be conflict between neurotypical and neurodiverse employees due to the different thinking styles, um, and especially with situations like um, autism and bipolar, where the behavior can often come off as rude or um, weird or strange. Strange. Making sure the coworkers understand that the the individual thinks differently, but they're an equivalent member of the team, and also that they should feel comfortable coming forward and saying, "Hey, we've been having this issue. Can we figure it out?" Because often the uh, neurodiverse individual doesn't know what's happening or hasn't thought about adjusting. So bringing up those topics is important. And lastly, patience and understanding. And just knowing that it's a learning experience for everyone involved, especially if you haven't worked with neurodiverse individuals. And so it's important that um, you just kind of be patient and expect a longer learning curve and challenges to come up. And lastly, the coworkers, what can they do? The key is awareness, um, keeping in mind that neurodiverse individuals are going to behave differently and that you can't come into interactions with them from a neurotypical perspective, um, that often when they communicate, the way they're communicating is not from the same viewpoint um, or thinking methods as a neurotypical employee. One thing I highly adv advocate for is learning and asking questions. I make sure all my coworkers know that they can ask me questions if anything comes to mind. I'd rather they bring up the topic and discuss it further, and I've talked to a lot of autistic people who say the same thing. Um, often, like, people feel uncomfortable or they're worried they're going to, like, uh, offend the autistic individual, which, one, we're very, very not easily offended. Like, I, I don't think I've ever been, like, offended by someone like in any way because I, I just don't get offended um, so so that's not an issue and really that's it's I'd much much rather you you learn um, from me as an autistic individual than just accept stereotypes and then again, patience and understanding. Understanding that there's going to be likely be conflicts that come up um, and that it's because of different thinking patterns that both individuals have not encountered before and it takes longer for us to adjust. Uh, so just a shout out to um, Patrick Putman. He's the main, uh, he go, has a website called The Bipolar Hacker where you can read more about his experience in the industry with bipolar disorder. Um, but he was one person I worked really close with to develop some content. Went back and forth a lot with him. <clears throat> Amanda Berlin, I like to call her out, she... Um, brought me on as the CEO, a CFO of Mental Health Hackers, which I've gotten to meet a lot of people um, facing different challenges in the industry. I've got to uh, wider spread my message by taking the, the Mental Health Village and speaking at additional conferences. Um, and she worked, she, she accepts some of my quirk, like all my quirks and all the weird messages I may send her. So she stuck, stuck with me uh, for like almost nine months now. So so far, so good. 
And then my manager, of course, he lets me, I was giving this talk in Poland last week and he lets me go and give this talk. And also he's practiced the things and learned from working with me as his first autistic employee. And he's done a very, very good job having me only been there five months learning and picking up and working with me on things. So any questions? Yeah. So you were talking about alternative avenues uh, to getting a job through the typical uh, interview process. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate with the form what is actually done? Yeah, so um, most of what I have from that aspect is is um, specifically focused on autism, but um, what a lot of the uh, recruiting firms and consulting firms do with autistic employees is because they don't do well in a setting, a traditional interview setting of being asked questions, having to socialize, um, especially things like the lack of eye contact and the stimming that will kind of throw an interviewer off, like, um, just because it's strange and they don't understand. Um, so they kind of mostly avoid the interview process outside originally initially bringing them into the program and what they do is instead kind of trial run um so IBM for example they have a up in Michigan they have a team that um is like eight quality assurance personnel uh who are autistic and they basically went through a program where there's the initial um the recruiting firm brought them in uh they did kind of a short interview more focused on like personality match and uh, then they worked um worked on the teams for six weeks and uh, then the company decided who to hire based on working with them directly because often once an, an, uh, an autistic individual is going to thrive behind the keyboard doing the work um, not in a Q&A type situation that they'll never actually like rarely ever encounter in person um, so having a social um, method of hiring is not good for someone who doesn't succeed socially. Having a kind of more technical um, interview is something that works better. Yeah. Any other? No more can I ask another Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask about in particular the, just how wide of a window of tolerance is for individuals with fairly large manic episodes. So if I have, say, one or two weeks where I'm very productive, mm -hmm. but then followed by one or two weeks where I can't be productive, yeah. is that... That's honestly going to depend on the organization and the role, and that's kind of like why role fit and niche construction is so important, because there are jobs that you definitely cannot just slack for a couple weeks. But if you end up as position, for example, um, working for oneself, like, consider um, a position, uh, obviously it's hard to start your own company, like, I'm not going to limit that but being in even if it's a startup where they're okay with you going on engagements that are typically that like working on engagements for a period of time and then step you away um, but again that's going to be the organization the role making sure you find a role where they're very flexible with your schedule um, but a lot of times like once you prove yourself um, uh, if the organization is accepting they'll work with you yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, for individuals who are already in a security role or a uh, technical role, but um, maybe not one that quite fits mm -hmm. what works best for them, um, how do you how do you suggest reaching out to? Or, this is a hard question to ask. Um, what would you suggest? Um, Somebody would do like Sam. Autistic Yeah. Two very conflicting things. Yeah. Um, what would you suggest that I do if I want to um, work in more of a response role, but my specialization is in a systemic um, role? Uh, so it's a combination of A, beginning to recognize those strengths and weaknesses, kind of figuring out what kind of role you're going to be best in. Uh, then it comes down to like the typical that even neuro 
typical people face that lateral movement path, um, which a lot of time is not an easy challenge. I'm not definitely not one to be able to explain how to laterally move. Um, I think a lot of people are trying to figure that out, but developing skills, getting certifications, and then being able to apply to those jobs in those different areas. And also articulate during your interview process about like, these are my strengths and this is why I'm trying to move into this field because I know I can thrive due to these things that my brain, it just works this way. Do you know any um, mental health organizations like Mental Health Packers? Um, do, you know any, uh, uh, do you know if you guys or similar organizations um, assist with lateral movements like that or have any classes related to that? I do not know of any myself uh, related to lateral movement and that kind of training. Um, I just, I do, I will say networking at conferences is probably one of the best way, like making those connections who can then get you places. I've definitely, I am very glad I started out early in my career making connections because like I'm in a place now where I feel like if I was like on the streets needing a job, I ha would have someone on my Twitter feed who, if I explain my situation, they'd find me a job kind of thing. Um, so I think that's one of the big things is building a network and then starting to ask that network, hey, do you have any recommendations on how I get here type of thing? Yep. Is there now places to actually go and get some type of yeah, um, so it's, it's actually interesting is a lot of 40, 50 year olds are now getting diagnosed with autism. Um, which typically it's you get diagnosed in the three to five year range. But 40, 50 years ago, uh, people weren't diagnosing autism. Um, and, and for a while after that, 20, 30 years ago, it, because it was so focused on kids are autistic, uh, adult diagnoses were so uncommon. It's finally becoming common. Um, typically what I'd recommend is talking to your PCP and they typically have recommendations, um, for who to go to. Um, but you'll want to speak to a psychiatrist specifically. They're the people who will be able to diagnose and make recommendations. Secondary to that question, uh, 20, 30 years ago, a very large stigma with mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, not very typical. Yeah. That's a bad thing to attach to it. Yeah. Something we thought of when you asked how we make that a little bit of straight and a clear path that they can be learned how to mask and how to. Yeah. Yeah. How you actually come out the folks you still work with have those kind of students. Recourses? Yeah, and that's very much what this, uh, a large focus of this that talk is autistic people are not going to thrive until they're in an environment that allows them to thrive, and a huge part of that is acceptance. And Honestly, that's kind of just like, how do you create acceptance in any other situation? How do you create acceptance for LBGTQ and um, other, you know, racial diversity in organization? It's the same issue. It's awareness and making it. And there's still going to be toxic environments that won't accept neurotypical individuals. And so at that point, like recognizing that you're in a toxic environment. Like I always say, if if I'm going to be repercussed for saying I'm autistic, I don't want to be at that company. I know a lot of individuals like are still kind of, I guess, in, in some way closeted and they don't want to share that information because of fear of repercussion and potentially they're in a career like I'm lucky in cybersecurity. There's a lot of job need and so I feel quite comfortable with like job security. Um, but like, at least for me, my path of thinking is if I'm going to say I'm autistic and then you're going to treat me horribly because of it, that's not the right job for me and I need to get out of that toxic environment because it's just gonna make um, my like being in that kind of environment is only gonna do damage to my mental health that that self-care kind of thing recognizing when I'm in environments that are negatively impacting me Does your organization Data on site as to what areas of the country or what cities within or 
Um, so I know that in the U.S., all the only thing that you declare when you're like disabled, like there's no form for me to say I'm autistic. Um, the only thing related to that is um, the the federal form that you've probably seen applying to jobs or whatever that says yes, I have a disability, but you don't specify. So I'm guessing there's not much data at any companies on that, um, especially my company. Uh, but we do have hiring programs for autism, and those hiring programs um, are slowly building in other countries. So we have statistics about where those hiring programs are taking place, which kind of shows which countries are more ahead in their thinking and their um, forward action on that. Anything else? Cool. Uh, well, I have to head back to the Mental Health Village, but if ever anyone wants to chat, you can follow me there. And.